May 17th, 1994. One of the best days of my life. I was on the all-Army track and field team, and we had just pulled into Hayes, Kansas. And I was excited. I was about to run the 400-meter hurdles. Now, when most people hear the word 400 meters and excitement, they run in the opposite direction. And when you add hurdles onto it, they bolt. But this was my domain. I loved this race because the race for the hurdler is already laid out complete for the individual. There's 45 meters to the first hurdle. The next nine barriers are 35 meters apart. And then a 40 meter sprint to the end, 400 meters. If you're trying to figure out the math, it does work. But I love this race. As I said, it is laid out for the hurdler. Each hurdler has their own set pattern. Edwin Moses, one of the greatest hurdlers of all time, he did it 13 steps every single barrier. My pattern, 22 steps out of the first hurdle, 13 steps down the back stretch. Then I would switch from my right leg to my left leg, 14 steps over the next barrier, 14 steps back to my right leg over to the seventh barrier, and then the rest, 15 steps all the way in, 49.91 seconds. That's the time I'd ran the week before, eighth fastest hurdler in the country at that time. I only have 15 minutes, so you all got to clip that clap and stuff. So I got to do my shakeout, my warm-up, and I was going over. But in Kansas, it's, it's kind of blustery and windy, and especially in Hayes. And so I was having problems with my steps. I was coming out of the blocks, 22 steps, 23 steps, 24 steps, back to 22 steps. And then I would go to the next hurdle, hurdles number two and three, 13 steps, 15 steps, 14 steps. And sometimes in life, just like in hurdles, we just want things to stay the same. So I thought I'd do the one proverbial last pass. I got in the blocks, and I shot out. And I went across the first hurdle, right leg leading, 22 steps. I was on target. Went across the next hurdle. 13 steps on target, and I felt the wind push against me, but I pushed myself back against the wind, trying to get that 13 steps to the next hurdle. But I knew as I saw it coming up faster and faster, closer and closer, that I was going to be short this time. As I told you, I switched hurdles on number six to go to my left leg so I can take with my left leg, and that's what I did. I took a charge off my right leg, put the left leg forward, and when I came down this time, I was just going to run out of it. I just saw myself doing that, shut it down for the next day, and I came down, and all of a sudden I heard a snap. And as I began to fall, forward. My left leg, which usually bends in this direction, had popped and went the other way. And as my body flew through the air, I saw my left leg do a helicopter spin and it crossed from the left side of my body across my chest. My, my right shoulder hit the ground and then my left shoulder hit the ground and my left leg rested over my right leg with the foot canted back towards my face and dislocated patella was up three inches. I did a once over my body and I saw the disfiguration of my left leg crossed over my right leg. 
no, 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 it's not happening. You just got to push yourself up. Just get yourself up. That's all I got to do. Just push yourself up. Just get to push yourself up. No, 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 no. Just get up, John. All I got to do. You're the fastest hurdle. You're going to be on the, going to the Olympic Games. Get you you got to just push yourself up. Oh, oh, God. And then 90 minutes later, my teammates, they were holding on to me and consoling me, but 90 minutes later, they were singing songs and hymns to, to keep me calm, but, but 90 minutes later, the ambulance came. And the medics loaded me in the back and we drove off to Hayes Medical Center with my legs still across my right I felt every bump as we drove the doctors put me back into the back of the hospital area and shifted me from one side to the next side and and as the doctor came in, he said to me, looks like, Mr. Register, uh, you got a little bit of a problem. <laughs> no, duh. <laughs> so he got two big guys on my shoulders, and he got on my disfigured leg, and he said, we got to put this thing back in place. We're going to do it on the count of three. One, set. And my leg just ballooned up, and I passed out. When I woke up, I was in Wichita, Kansas, and I'd just gone through an 11-hour vein graft operation. My popliteal artery had been severed. Time had passed too long, and it just wasn't working. I went through the next day's five more operations. And that's when the doctor came in, and I was sitting in the hospital bed, laying up there, and my wife, Alice, had my hand, and my mom and dad were on the other side of the bed, and Dr. Randy, Mull Randy Mullins came in, and he, he said, John, you know, we've had to try to reconstruct your artery, and it just hasn't worked adequately enough, so you have a tough decision to make. What, what's that, Doc? What, what kind of decision? Well, you can either keep your limb and use a wheelchair for the rest of your life. And is there another, is there another choice? Or you can take an amputation, but at least you'll be able to walk on a prosthetic. Now, what kind of a choice is that? between not walking and not really walking. And I turned back to the doctor and I said, Dr. Mullins, I, 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 I know what has to happen. I, I know it has to be amputated. And as soon as I spoke those words, my wife Alice, her hand just slipped away from mine. My mom and dad, they walked to two different corners. And Dr. Mullins said, we'll begin tomorrow. I woke up in that hospital room about 20 hours later. It was 11 o'clock at night, and there I was, alone. And I could see the nurse's aid station. I was in tremendous pain. And I thought that if I just had my leg amputated, logic says that I'm not going to have this pain anymore. And I was in such tremendous pain, I, I began to rethink my decision about having an amputation. And as I saw the nurse's aid station, I just wanted something to knock me out. But I was too weak to, to roll over and get my call button to get them to come over. And my voice was too scratchy from the tubes that had been down my throat to call for the nurses to come. So I just had to watch the clock on the wall, ticking away. 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock. Two o'clock, and it was just my life was ticking away. I began to think, who was I now? What was my identity? 
Am I still a father to my son? Is my, is my wife going to stick around? Who am I now? Do I still have a job in the United States Army? Can I still support my family? How will my parents think about me? What will society say about this guy with this one leg? And there I lay watching that clock in my life go five, six. At seven o'clock, Dr. Randy Mullins came in the room, saw me in my state, and he said, uh, John, you need to get some fresh air and get outside. So he called my wife, and it took them 45 minutes to get me in a wheelchair, push me outside. My son and myself, we were on the playground, and my wife, and they went to go swing on the swings, and they were about 20, 20 feet away. And I was so weak, I could not push myself up out of that wheelchair. And I just lost it. I just broke down, started bawling, started crying. My wife saw me struggling. She comes running over. Alice comes running over. She says, what's wrong? What's wrong? What's going on, John? And, and I began to articulate all the things that had happened the night before in that hospital room. And she said the words that stopped my downward spiral. You know what, John? We are going to get through this together. It's just our new normal. It's just our new normal. Our new normal, my new normal. That's what I had to do. I had to create my new normal. Maybe it wasn't about the amputation. Maybe it was about what I could create in the future, my new normal. John Jr. comes, jumps off the swings. Daddy, 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 what's going on? And in those five seconds that he ran those 20 yards, he had just validated me as his father and created his new normal. I had to create my new normal. It wasn't about losing the limb. Those Olympic dreams had been amputated. It was about looking at what was future. So I had to think about those things that I could aspire towards. I began swimming for physical therapy. And 18 months later, I went to the Paralympic Games as a Paralympic swimmer. I saw athletes running on the track. And they had artificial legs. I had one made for myself. And four years later, I had not only had the American record in the long jump, I took the silver medal in Sydney, Australia, creating the new normal. May 17th, 1994. Best day of my life. That's the day I was able to create my new normal. Thank you.